is one of the uh, founding faculty members of a permanent faculty <coughs> at the FSU Coastal Marine Lab. Um, and some of his work has been instrumental in uh, management decisions in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, for example, uh, his work, along with his wife, Felicia Coleman, uh, was really key in establishing the only two full year-round marine reserves in the Gulf of Mexico, in the eastern Gulf of Mexico, at least. Is that the whole? Not the whole. Well, full, yeah, year-round. Yeah, year-round. Complete closure. Madison Swanson. Yeah and uh, steamboat lumps. So uh, quite, quite an accomplishment right there. And I'm sure, I'm sure there are people who really did not like him for a long time for that. Um, although they have, a lot of those people came full circle because they saw the benefits of those marine reserves. He also did a lot of important work on the uh, Oculina reefs off the east coast of Florida. Um, has uh, been instrumental in understanding habitat relationships and spawning relationships in uh, various species of grouper and has been very involved with uh, Goliath <coughs> grouper research. And uh, I got to tell you just a couple of little stories. First of all, when I interviewed for my postdoc position, <coughs> the time when I knew that things were really going well was when I told Chris because I was coming from Oregon, where we have those big gigas oysters, which are kind of nasty <laughs> and gross. And I said, I want some gulf oysters. And I want to just sit down and drink a beer and have a gulf oyster. And we sat on his back deck <laughs> for hours, I think. Hours, <laughs> hours. Which is the way you do it. And then, and then the other great thing is, is, you know, Chris still has such a great curiosity about evolution and ecology. We would be out on a boat trawling at 3 o'clock in the morning, I'm tired and cranky, wet and cold. And he's looking at this half beak. You guys know what a half beak is? It's like a ballyhoo, you know? And he's, he's just going on and on for 10 minutes, 20 minutes about the evolutionary beauty of this thing in its mouthpiece. And I'm like, come on, Chris, let's get going here. It was delirium. <laughs> it might have been delirium. Fair so Chris is going to tell us about some of the work that, that we've been collaborating on uh, on the last grouper spawning. Oh, thank you. Okay, well, um, what I'm going to do is um, give you a kind of a chronological um, advancement in the um, uh, in in our efforts to try to d decide the um, uh, when and where and how Goliath group respond, and everything about the reproductive biology, but primarily the timing. Hence the title. Um, you know, we started in 1990, and uh, at that time the population was at an all-time low. I mean, it was the time when a, a fisherman, one single fisherman, who's probably killed more Goliath grouper than anyone else in southeastern United States, his name is Don De Maria. He w he saw what he was doing during the 80s, and he uh, petitioned the council, the fishery management councils, to um, uh, to close the fishery. That's such a rare thing to see a fisherman do. Uh, and so they were closed in 1990 without any, uh, anyone complaining about it, any fisherman or anybody. So, um, so what, I'll start, what I'll do is start in 1990, and I'll go through primarily with the timing, dial, lunar, and seasonal. Now, seasonal is, um, is pretty much correlative information that we have about uh, the seasonal timing uh, <coughs> of, of spawning uh, and then settlement in uh, conditions in the mangrove that are uh, apparently ideal for that. All right, let's see here. Show me this, would you? So uh, that is for that's for us, okay. and this is the... Uh, oh, that's laser. Okay. okay. So first, let me give you a little background on Goliath group here. I know a lot of you know this, but um, uh, I, what I'd like to do is give you a, um, an overview of the population. Atlantic Goliath grouper was, in 2009, it used to be called Goliath grouper until Matt Craig, a geneticist, fish geneticist, determined that there were more than one species. The range of this, of this fish goes from North Carolina all the way to southern Brazil including the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean, as you can see there. I'm colorblind, so I can't see all that, but I, I know that's where, that's where they are. 
And then um, what Matt identified was the Pacific Goliath grouper was a distinct species, whereas prior to that work, they thought they were the same species. Um, and it extends over a similar latitudinal range um, uh, on, the, on, the, um, on the west coast of the Americas. Uh, but there's very little known about it. And there's only one person that I know, graduate students, is actually working on it. And then the third presumed di distinct species would be the African Goliath grouper. However, in the last 20 years, nobody's seen one, caught one, or heard of one being caught. So it's probably gone extinct. So if people say that highly fecund fish can't go extinct, that's a good example to show that they can. And it probably is extinct. Um, now just generally the life cycle is that uh, they spawn on these uh, shelf reefs. Um, uh, they, they like, like uh, high-relief structure, wrecks and artificial reefs that are high-relief. Uh, historically, they would, um, they would live on, on, on natural reefs, of course, because there were no wrecks or artificial reefs, and, and, and they would dig them out. So a lot of these places had big caverns underneath them. And they still do that in places, but like most animals, they're lazy, and they take advantage of those big artificial reefs. And that's where most of the spawning is on those reefs. They have a pelagic larvae with a very extended... Uh, 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 pelagic larval duration, 30 to 80 days. Now that, that deserves more study to see, what, see exactly what, uh, what's going on there. Um, so it seems like they, they, they've got some sort of an adaptation to, uh, to extend, like some, of the, like some of the wrasses do, to extend their pelagic larval duration. Uh, then they settle into mangrove nurseries. And when they settle, they settle into leaf litter leaf litter from, from the mangroves that is submerged, of course. And um, uh, they, they match that habitat very well. After, I don't know, maybe six months, the first year, they move to these undercuts where you can see this. Those are mangrove roots hanging down. And, um, and so that's pretty much it. After about five to six years, they go and join the adult uh, population. Longevity of adults is was, was measured by Lou Bullock at the FWRI over here, and he, um, uh, he, he, was, he was working on these fish when they were already extremely overexploited, and so they probably live a lot longer than that. Um, okay, they're native to the southeast, most abundant in Florida, and they were um, designated as critically endangered throughout their range. This is Atlantic. I'm, speaking specifically of Atlantic Goliath grouper, but Pacific Goliath grouper is probably in the same boat. Um, but there's virtually no data on them. Um, they're fully protected in the southeastern U U.S., as I said, from 1990 in the Caribbean and Brazil since, 93 to, uh, since 1993. But uh, enforcement in, uh, in a lot of countries, including Brazil, is very, very poor. And Mauricio here, our, our um, visitor from Brazil, um, our guest, is, um, just showed me a picture of one being dragged up onto the beach. And, you know, there's no enforcement at all, so the laws are kind of without teeth. Um, and they're recovering in the southeastern United States. Now, the decline, of course, uh, overfishing had a tremendous amount to do with the decline, and these pictures were quite common in newspapers, and Ori showed even more this morning. But mangrove nursery in these undercuts here is, is some of their primary habitat, and um, uh, it's critical to their early development, that nursery, I mean that mangrove uh, um, uh, habitat, although they, they do occupy microhabitats that you find out when you start trying to catch them. The, um, the interesting thing here, and probably a large, now I say probably because I don't know, but I, I would expect, since there were so many of them there, and I couldn't find them anywhere else, that the 10,000 islands is probably the reason why the recovery was so, uh, it started almost immediately after 1990. The, the, the juveniles started showing up uh, in the creel surveys of the Everglades National Park in 94. And then they started showing up offshore in about 98, 99, 
in that time. Uh, and, and those data come from the Reef Environmental uh, Education Foundation, which takes volunteer divers surveys. And so I've, I've, I validated those surveys and then, uh, and then uh, used them to, to show recovery. And probably this is a good place because of, in 1974, the uh, Big, uh, Big Cypress um, uh, Swamp was designated a, um, you know, a national preserve. And there's only two of them in the United States. There's one in Texas and this one. <laughs> And so uh, they're very carefully management, uh, managed. There's no agriculture, no urbanization, things like that going on in there. So basically, clean water comes to the mangroves in relatively, uh, you know, in a, in a, a, rather than huge pulses, they, it comes in a continuous uh, 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 drainage so that you, you don't have either fresh or salt. So it's a, it's a good system, as good as it is in Florida. Um, so let me talk about spawning aggregations. This uh, picture taken by Walt Stearns is uh, off Jupiter, Florida. And uh, this is pretty typical of the spawning aggregations there. They occur in, uh, in this area off the west coast of South Florida. And in this area right in through here off Palm Beach in the lower part of Martin County, on the East Coast, and I haven't found them anywhere else except there's evidence that one might have been forming up by, here by the Marine Lab, but we're going to check that. If, they, if it did, it breaks apart very early uh, before the end of the spawning season down here. There's another indication that the fish that, that spawn deeper, um, and the deepest site we have is 175 feet, and that's located way down here. They actually spawn later. They spawn into November. There's good evidence for that. Um, but typically, the spawning takes place in August, September, through the middle of October. And I'll go into more detail on that. Now, here's, a pic here's the reef data that I talked about. And you can see there's a little blips here, but then, boom, it jumped up in 99, and then 2000 goes along. This peak here is probably due to the freeze that occurred in, um, in, in, uh, in January of 2010. Uh, and Angela, I spoke to Angela about that, and she said she saw lots of young ones after that offshore. So apparently, beyond a certain size, they got away from the freeze, and anything smaller than that died in the mangroves because there was a, according to the Creel survey, there was a tremendous die off. About 95% uh, of the juveniles died off. And because temperature, snaps like that, cold snaps are so pervasive, it, it affects the whole entire recruitment uh, for five years. So anyway, that's, that occurred. In, so right now, the recruitment should be starting to come back into, uh, you know, back into the normal situation. Again, reef data, this is off Palm Beach County, and I didn't write it here, but the southern part of, uh, just the lower tip of Martin County too, um, uh, and the red indicates the spawning months and the green non-spawning months. So you can see here that um, in the non-spawning months, you got this increase and it kind of levels off. But during the spawning months, it increased. And you can see not until about 2003, 2004, about 2005, they started really increasing. And so the aggregations have increased. This, these numbers don't pay any attention, just the relative increase here. Because these are... Um, there were a lot of non-spawning sites that were included in those data. I couldn't, I, I don't know all the spawning sites, so I couldn't separate that out. But basically, those, this is probably too, too, too truncated. It should be larger. But it's just the pattern that I wanted to show you. All right, now what I wanted to talk about is timing of spawning. Now in 1990, my colleague at that time, Pat Colin, uh, and I, uh, was shown sites, this is Don DeMaria here, Pat Cullen, uh, were shown sites uh, out way out into the Gulf of Mexico that he had fished. Now, the way he did this, the way he located these places where these fish spawn and other places, was he would go to the bars and he'd start talking to the shrimpers. And he'd say, where are your hangs? You give me your numbers of your hangs. <laughs> because when they hang up on, a, on something on the bottom, it's likely that it's a wreck. 
um, they record that so they don't run over it every time. Their nets are expensive. And so he found a lot of spawning sites out there, and De Maria is a very, very meticulous and uh, cautious uh, uh, observer. He records everything. He's like an accountant. And uh, so he, we had a lot of good information about where they were. And he, he knew the biology. His wife's a biologist. So he knew the biology well enough to know that they were in spawning condition when he caught them. And he knew when the spawning season was because their populations would come way up. But he also knew that they were declining rapidly and he couldn't get any more. So anyway, so uh, we dived on these things. And they had like eight fish on one, you know, and five on another. It was, didn't look like a spawning aggregation to me, but they had been heavily depleted. And uh, Pat decided that, um, that these color variations that occurred uh, were related to spawning. Because he did a lot of work in the Virgin Islands, but... You know, it's not his fault. Basically, he, um, you know, we, we had a very l restricted conditions to study these things. We couldn't get any sex data because they're not, they're not sexually dimorphic. You look at one, you don't know whether it's male or female. Um, and we got no gonad data because we didn't catch any. So we knew very little. But Pat hypothesized full moon, midday, pear spawning. <laughs> which is probably exactly the opposite of what it is. <laughs> so I'll go, I'll go, that was the first attempt, and you know, that's just the way it is. This is a whitehead pattern that, that Pat thought was significant in reproduction, and these fish sometimes would line up like these two, and they look very much like conies. He, he gave me a video of conies, and conies line up like that, and then they go through their spawning run, boom, pair spawning. So that's what gave him that idea. And then, um, but there's other forms like this blackhead. <laughs> we don't know what that means either. <coughs> and these, so these things occur and you're going, I don't know. I don't know whether they're male and female. So people would assume that the whiteheads were males when there's absolutely zero data to show that they are. Because you have to catch them. And a lot of these color changes are ephemeral. So you can't, you, you, know, you know, it comes up on deck and he doesn't have a color pattern, and it's hard to select them at the bottom, I'll tell you. So what we did, uh, we knew that they made booming sounds. They make it on the, on the spawning aggregations all the time, and so these booming sounds uh, led me and others to believe that uh, maybe they had unique spawning sounds that they produced at night. So David Mann was the guy, and so I went to David and Jim, both of them working together, uh, to... Um, you know, to evaluate these, these, uh, these sounds and, and to record them overnight. Uh, throughout the whole spawning se season, actually, not just overnight, but over the whole spawning season. And at the same time, to, um, uh, to place in the fish a, um, a pinger. Now, the pinger that I bought was, uh, had a 10-second interval because what I wanted, and it, it, it recorded depth, okay, it transmitted depth. depth. Now, I didn't want to catch the Goliath groove and put it, you know, implant it intraperitoneally because it would have been a tremendous uh, stress on the fish. So Don, being the expert spear fisherman that he is, he actually attached it to the side of the fish with a tag that had a, a special head on it that hung it into the side of the fish. So, and we didn't know whether it was a male or a female. Um, uh, but we did that on a one spawning site and then put a receiver down to receive these data. Uh, and it was one way out of the way because when they put out every 10 seconds, it'll just swamp everybody else's pinger in the area. So we didn't want to do that and there were other people working. So we put it way down by the Tortugas. And then we put one of these passive rec uh, acoustic receivers on the Fantastico, which is another site off of uh, Sanibel uh, that we knew was a spawning site. And um, um, uh, Jim and David and, and Felicia and I uh, published this uh, in Endangered Species Research. Uh, Jim and David worked up the, the data, and we found that these single booms were the characteristic um, uh, uh, sounds that they made. They were the, the typical sounds that they made. And uh, I also, we also found out that, that on a lunar pattern, these are full moons, um, that more than them 
peaking out on a new moon, they were actually declining in these sounds on full moons. So those declines, um, let me see something here. So this is the sounds that we were hearing. Those are spawning, oops. Why did that do that? That's, that's the energy in each one of these peaks that you see here, each peak. And this is uh, the, the energy level. And they put out the, this at a frequency of about, uh, maximally at about 60 hertz. And so the energy you see in these peaks uh, are the sounds that you hear. And they occurred at night. So all the peaks are at night. Uh, so we knew that there was a pattern, somehow the full moon uh, of these night times, by the way, they don't occur any other time except the spawning season. And then Jim and I um, uh, uh, put receivers on these various wrecks. It starts here at about September uh, on these late. So you, you're seeing September and October peaks. These two, these two are in the Gulf. Again, you see that typical pattern of peak spawn, uh, uh, sa sounds at night. And then the MG-111, which is off Jupiter. Now, that fish that was tagged with a pinger that had a very short return, a uh, very short interval on, on, on putting out its, uh, its ping, and that indicated depth, uh, uh, you, we could see that fish would go up every so often. Again, this was a deep site, so they were spawning a little late in the season. And this is, I spread this thing out so you could see it actually uh, clearly. So they'd go up, you know, 20 meters off the bottom or more um, and um, uh, at night, all at night. So the pattern, um, if you put number of pings per grouper uh, that have traveled 36 or have gone up, um, you know, um, uh, up, up off the bottom like I just showed you, then we saw, we saw, and this is a frequency histogram showing that, we saw about 2100 through 2300, it increased in frequency of that individual going up, one fish tagged, and then at 3 a.m. they did the same thing. So basically, we had, whoops, what happened to it? 